Okay, welcome to our talk. Um, we want to start on time because we have a lot of stuff to show and to cover. Um, my name is Jan, I'm working on the Spring Framework support in IntelliJ. And my name is Stefan, I'm working in the Spring team and also working with tools and uh, tooling support. So this talk is basically, uh, we are going to do 100% of live coding. So we are going to step through um, a lot of Spring stuff, a lot of Spring sub-projects, showing some tips and tricks, but also explaining the rationale about uh, specific features. Why did we put them in there? And that's mainly uh, Stefan's part, because he's the guy from the Spring framework, and I'm mostly going to show the IDE stuff. Um, the sample project is available on GitHub. Um, I'll post the URL later on on Twitter again. Um, and it also includes the script, so you can basically follow everything we did today uh, on your own. So before we start, uh, we have a handful of uh, small questions. So who is using Spring in their projects right now? Uh, Not everybody. Uh, okay. 40% maybe. Okay. <laughs> Um, it was using IntelliJ. Yeah. Oh, that's wow. nearly everyone. <laughs> 80%. Uh, yeah. okay. uh, who's using uh, Eclipse or STS? Okay, a few people to impress, hopefully, today. 5%. So, um, where's the one guy using NetBeans in this uh, audience? N no one, okay. He maybe comes later. Yeah, he's too shy, I think. Yeah. Okay, so let's go. Uh, we'll step right into the sample project. So I just opened this uh, Spring demo, uh, which is available on uh, the GitHub account. And immediately I see this notification in the lower right corner about unmapped Spring configuration. You cannot read the text here because it's presentation mode, so everything is bigger than usual. Uh, but we need to do this because the screen is so small. Uh, what is this about? Um, the IDE needs to understand how your project is structured. Not only the modules and sources, but also the configuration of frameworks. So the Spring support in IntelliJ, uh, the way it works is we build a model in the IDE of the stuff you're doing with Spring. So we know about your configurations, we know about your beans, we know about profiles and all the other stuff. And we calculate this on the fly in the IDE. We do not actually fire up a Spring context, but we do this ourselves. To be able to do this, we need to understand how is your Spring configuration meant to be during runtime. And that's the point where the uh, Spring facet configuration comes into play. Um, a facet is basically a way to tell the IDE about specific frameworks in your project. And uh, this so don't dismiss that notification. Yeah, yeah. That's really important. <laughs> yeah. So it, it also tells you to do this because otherwise the Spring support in IntelliJ will basically not work. Most of you will probably have figured out about this, but it's a very very important step to do this right. Usually you do it once and then you're done. But please don't forget about it. There's one special case. Um, we are going to look at the actual facet uh, in a few minutes. Um, there are so-called auto-detected file sets, so there are some configurations we can detect automatically. You don't have to tell the IDE about it, but it will detect them automatically because there are specific rules. Uh, this is basically limited to Spring MVC applications as well as to Spring Boot applications. We'll see this later in the talk. So let's start with our first uh, configuration class, uh, main configuration. As you can see, it's highlighted as yellow, and the IDE tells us that this class is not used. And the reason is because we have not set it up in the Spring facet. Uh, so the IDE is unsure what this class is about. Um, you will also see, by the way, the shortcuts I'm using uh, on the very bottom of the IDE, showing very quickly. Uh, so that helps to understand what I'm actually doing here. And the first thing we want to do is to fix that, of course. That configuration uh, should be used. So I'm using the alt enter shortcut to invoke the uh, quick fix menu. That's a well known shortcut. And I can just create a spring facet right from the editor. I don't have to go to the settings. 
So during the presentation, we're going to create separate facet per sample. So uh, don't take that as granted. I mean, in your project, you usually have one facet with all your configuration, or maybe you're using parent-child relation, parent-child application context, and then you need two facets with two different file sets. Yeah. But in our case, we are going to create facets separately so that the samples don't clash with each other. So that's what I just did. I created a new application context in this spring facet, and I'm going to include only the main configuration class. All the other classes we are going to use uh, later on, and we are not including them in our spring context right now. And now pay attention to the left side of the editor. When I do this, it will immediately show a bunch of icons. And that's always the sign that the IDE now understands that this class is supposed to be in a Spring context, which you are using in your project. Uh, because all the navigation features uh, we are going to uh, investigate um, are present and shown in the editor now. So the first thing I want to show is uh, this icon here, which says Spring model dependencies. What could this be? So the idea is uh, you set up those configuration classes in the Spring facet, but configurations can be very complicated. There are imports, component scan, and whatnot. And sometimes it's very hard to understand what will the actual configuration look like at runtime when all the component scan uh, runs, when all the imports are used, when you use patterns to include files of a specific name or all configuration files in a specific location. So what will actually end up in my application context? We can just look at this right in the IDE. I hope you can see it a bit, it's a bit bad projecting. Um, so the idea is that we show the resulting graph of configuration files which will be used at runtime. For this class? For this class, exactly. So on the very left, we have main configuration. We have a few imports here, another import here. And at the very right, we have some component scans. So that's very nice, quick way to inspect what your actual setup will look like at runtime. And I think... Uh, Maybe you want to say some words of wisdom about component scan? Oh, um, now? So, yeah. Any anyway, word of wisdom of component scan is try to use that at, at the highest level possible. If you're building a library, if you're building ind independent modules, try not to use component scan at that level because it can, be, it can become quite nasty and be more explicit in your config. And that kind of tool like, actually helps you to figure out when you import a specific configuration class what kind of beans you're going to get. Mm. which prevents you to import them twice, for instance, which is a common mistake. So, of course, you have code insight on all these annotations of Spring, so we are including an uh, XML configuration from this class here, and it imports another XML. We can, of course, navigate there as well. And what we have here uh, is the actual component scan, which was on the very right in the model graph uh, I just showed you. So the whole tree was visible in the graph. And yeah, as we said, just the, uh, the, the problem with uh, component scan actually is that it's very easy to um, build stuff that doesn't do what you would like to do it. And what I'm doing now is I'm doing the same component scan twice in that file to simulate a setup error or duplication, an accidental duplication uh, in, my meta, uh, in my setup. And I hope you can see it, but there's two red lines here, and they show that I have actually cycles between the XML file and the component scanned configurations because everything is doubled. So that's a nice way to inspect uh, such setup problems. In practice, the application context would probably start all fine because we are going to resolve those conflicts and be smart about it when importing resources. But if one of those components, for instance, import a, a, a configuration class where uh, you don't have any ID on a bean, so typically you have bean class, um, the con what the context will do, it will generate, it will auto-generate an ID. And if it's being processed twice, well, obviously, the auto-generated ID will be different. So in the end, you'll end up with two beans of that type, whereas you probably expect to have only one. So that kind of tool with cycles helps you to track those problems and fix them quite easily. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 
that's the part about setting up stuff. Uh, we are going now into the uh, actual features. Uh, there's another icon here on the left, uh, which is attached to the component scan. Um, I'm scanning a package here with all sub-packages. And what I can do here is to navigate to the actual scanned beans from exactly that declaration. So that's also a nice way to inspect, am I doing what I actually want to do with this component scan? Um, oh, what's the reach of that component scan? So if yeah. you want to know how many beans that, in, that uh, annotation is actually bringing, then you can easily see it. Yeah. Uh, we see a few other icons down here. Uh, we can actually navigate to resolved auto-wired dependencies here. And um, if you are getting annoyed by too many icons, there's a new uh, setting in uh, the latest version of IntelliJ. Uh, it's called gutter icons. And we can see here that's the whole a list of gutter icons which can be provided by the Spring support. There's, there's quite a lot of different navigation functionalities provided by those gutter icons. And you can switch on and off uh, to your liking. So if you're getting annoyed, just get rid of them here. So we have to stand out component scan here. And there's another line below that which has something with component scan in there as well. And that's um, a meta annotation uh, we created here. So what's a meta annotation? So meta annotation is something that, ex that exists in the framework for quite some time. And in, in 4.2 and 4.3, it has been greatly improved uh, with this new annotation alias 4. Uh, so a meta annotation is basically an annotation defining a, a more tailored contract. So um, if you want to combine two annotations into one for a specific use case, you can create an annotation of yours and put, that annota put those two annotations on it, and it will replace effectively those two annotations. So in the past, uh, you could do attributes override because yeah, annotations have attributes, and you, want, you would like to be able to customize them even in your own custom annotations. And it wasn't the, the override mechanism wasn't that explicit. As of fall two, uh, or for three, for two, I think. There is an alias for annotations that you can use to say this particular attribute on my custom annotation is going to override a, s a standard one. So mm -hmm. basically, in this case, my package something is going to uh, override the base package's uh, standard attributes of component scan. And the nice thing about it is that the editor will actually figure that out, so process that custom annotation of yours, and will provide the same hint uh, as the one you get with the standard annotation. Yeah. So again, you have full code inside uh, in uh, the attribute here. Um, I'm referring to the component scan class redefining the attribute, just as Stefan explained. And I can navigate to the original attribute. Uh, and uh, if you own all those uh, annotations, you can even use refactoring right from here. So going back to our configuration class, using our own meta annotation, the IDE shows, again, the same icon because it knows that this meta annotation is a component scan. So we can show the same list of beans here as well. OK, so much about uh, meta annotations. And the next thing I want to show you is the uh, Spring tool window. Um, it's maybe something not many people have used, but it's uh, really useful for various tasks. So I'm just going to glance over this very quickly because it's very easy to figure this out by yourself. Uh, we have a split window uh, which shows from left to right the hierarchy, starting on the modules, going to the uh, application context we defined in this module on the Spring facet, and then going to the configuration classes, and then going to the actual defined beans. Um, I can bring up the uh, documentation for the bean here. So I can just browse my application context and inspect all beans, all configurations, the hierarchy between them. Uh, you can see there are a bit different colored here because those are implicit beans, which are provided automatically by Spring. Uh, you can switch them on and off to your liking. And some more little tricks uh, are available here. Maybe the, the most important thing is that you can use uh, F4 to navigate to any of those items. So I can just jump now to the configuration class or to the bean. And 
the uh, nice thing is that this also works the other way around. So if you are inspecting some code somewhere, which is Spring related, uh, and you want to know where is this defined in my Spring setup, uh, you can use the shortcut select in, that's Alt F1. And this always allows you to select the currently selected element in any of the tool windows which support this. And I can select this in the Spring Beans tool window now, and it will automatically navigate me to the tree where this bean or this configuration in this uh, case uh, is located in the tree I'm using. OK, so much about the Spring Tool window. Let's go back very quickly to our configuration class. And the next topic is about auto-wiring as well as profiles. So who has used profiles in their application? Spring profiles. 10%. Yeah, yeah. OK, not too many. Um, why would I use profiles in my application? So, yeah, one thing you could do with profiles is uh, change your application context according to a certain environment. So mostly what you would do is you may have a QA profile, a test profile, a production profile, and you, you may bring, for instance, in the test profile mock for third-party services or remote services, whereas the production profile would actually be remote client to those. And activating a profile is very, very easy. There is a property you set with the list of profiles that you want to enable. And uh, we will inspect the configuration. So you, in Spring Boot, you can, you can very easily customize the configuration. And you can also add a profile annotation on your beans. And if you do, only that bean definition will be invoked if the, the given profile is active. Mm. So one thing, one problem that you get when you work, we can see that we have an error in the long field here. Maybe you can't see it, but there is a red thing be below auto-wired um, auto long bean. One problem you may have with those setup is um, making sure that if you deploy that application with, that, with a certain profile enabled, that application will actually work. So that application will actually resolve the thing that you're supposed to provide. Mm. In this case, we can see from the error message that two beans are present for that type. And the application context won't be able to know uh, because there is no primary. The application context will not, able, will not be able to know at runtime how to, which one it should wire into that field. Mm. And the editor tells you. And as we will see later, it can also tell you that if you switch profiles. So we will see that in a minute. Which, which I'm going to do, right? So okay. um, during editing, I want to use or simulate some currently active profile because um, I cannot activate all of them because they duplicate some things, some things are missing in one or the other. So I, I want to have the, the profile uh, like I have it on my dev environment or production environment. And uh, to do that, there's uh, this editor toolbar here on the top, uh, which allows me to change the active profiles. And now is the important point. The IDE will use from now on in the editor to simulate what profiles would be active at runtime. So when I do this, I get a list of profiles which are defined in the current uh, Spring context. So we have a custom and domain profile. Sorry for the bad names. Uh, at least they are distinguishable. And I can now select only the main profile and apply that. And now I'm down to two beans, because the one provided which is only available in the custom profile is gone. The IDE does not care about it, because I just told it to ignore it. Still, we have a problem here. There are two of them. And what I can do is uh, another quick fix, which will add a qualifier. So when you are in such a situation, either you mark one of them as primary, and in case of um, several beans of the several candidates, uh, the context, the application context, will take the primary one. But if you don't want to do that for whatever reason, you can use a qualifier so you can tag uh, one of those bean or both bean definitions and at the injection point says, I want the bean with that tag, and the tag is the qualifier. Yeah. Again, never hesitate to control click or control space anywhere in attributes or stuff. Usually it works. So again, here I can navigate to the actual bean. And it confirms that uh, this name is correct. And 
this profile, this configuration is only active in main profile, so the IDE just selected the correct bean I want to use or simulate to be using. There is still an issue, though. It's still complaining. Yes, it's still complaining about the ultrawired. And there's a <laughs> funny text here. <laughs> uh, Who okay. knows Oliver Gierke, uh, the lead of the Spring Data Project? Nobody? Maybe I, OK. That's 5%. Oliver will be happy, I'm sure. So uh, Oliver is the guy who advocates strongly against field injection. He wrote a, I wouldn't call it famous. OK, then, <laughs> then you see it, if you can see him. And he's actually doing something like that, yeah. just to tell you don't use field injection. So he, he, he wrote a blog post years ago explaining why field injection was evil. And still a lot of people are using it, so we thought that maybe we can do something at the uh, editor level. Yeah. Of course, if you disagree with us, because the last time we did that presentation, someone was really angry, uh, apparently, uh, because he was using field injection and found it quite cool. Um, if, you, if you disagree with that inspection, you can disable it, of course, as yeah. always. So of course, there's a, a fix in IntelliJ, because it's like uh, stupid work nobody wants to do manually, uh, so I can just uh, convert this field injection to the proper one, which is constructor injection. And so, yeah, the IDE so will do it for me. So the thing to remember in, in IntelliJ is whenever you have an inspection that tells you something isn't right, most of the time, if you invoke that quick, uh, that, the, that quick shortcut, so Alt-Enter, um, you'll, get, you'll get a pop-up suggesting something that will fix the issue. Mm. So going back to the uh, profiles, uh, we still have two candidates. Uh, we are in the main profile. So I'm going now to switch the active profile to custom profile instead. And what you will actually see is this qualifier becomes invalid because there is no such bean with that name in the custom profile. So we can get rid of it. And uh, the auto wiring will still work. We just got this new icon here and we can navigate to the bean which is only active in a custom profile, which I just activated. So you can see the IDE really understands all these connections and all the rules uh, behind all of this. So the rule to remember for all this to work, we already said it at the beginning, but I want to say it again, is uh, the, the spring facet needs to be configured and you need to provide the list of configuration classes and XML configuration if you happen to use that so that IntelliJ can parse them and figure out what bins definition you have. Mm. OK, we are now switching to a different uh, topic, which is uh, Spring caching. And I'm going to set up another application context, uh, again, using the intention here. That's uh, nothing we uh, must do manually. I'm just going to ca call this caching context. So quickly, cache the caching That's infrastructure was using it. Cacheable and friends, 5%. OK. So one thing you could do with the cache abstraction in Spring Framework is tag a method of your bean um, so that the, the, the framework actually integrates with the caching library. And what the framework will do, it will put a proxy on top of your method call. And before invoking the method, it will, well, we have that example here, mm -hmm. it will compute a key. So in this case, it will take start and end. It will compute a key with that. And it will look in a certain cache if an entry exists for that key. If that's the case, it will return the object in the cache and will not even invoke your method. So your business logic won't be invoked. If, on the other hand, there is nothing in the cache for that key, it will invoke the method as you would have without the framework. And before returning the object to the caller, it will update the cache so that the next call has a chance to actually hit the cache. Mm -hmm. So what you need to do to make that happening, and we had the, the configuration in the, in the previous uh, class, is you basically need to put enable caching, and you need to provide a cache manager implementation. So in this case, we are using a simple one, which uses concurrent hash maps in memory, so no, no cache library. But if you happen to use EHCache, infinite span, Hazelcast, whatnot, we have support for that too. OK, so we set up our caching context, and uh, I put the cacheable annotation on this interface method, and the IDE 
has some specific knowledge about how to use the uh, cacheable annotations properly. And one thing you should not do, you can do, but you shouldn't really, is mm -hmm. to annotate the interface methods with those cache annotations. Why, why is that? Because idea? it's a detail of your implementation. You shouldn't like force all your implementations to have cache for this. If one implementation decide it doesn't want to do it, it should freely, freely be able to do so. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really an implementation concern, and you should really not put that at the, implement, at the interface level. OK. So we already fixed it here? You should have a quick fix to move it to the implementation, by the way. You know Maybe, that? yeah. <laughs> I'll take that as uh, homework with me. Uh, okay. So uh, I prepared, of course, perfectly, uh, put the catchable already on the implementation of this interface. Uh, still, it's not happy, because it wants a cache name. Uh, so a cache name is basically a semantic uh, uh, distinction. Yeah, a reference to the yeah, cache yeah, to, in, yeah. to use, basically. So uh, we should provide one. And uh, you can do this on the cacheable annotation itself, but you can also set up a cache config annotation uh, on the parent level and provide a generic cache name for all the caches used in that class. So now it's happy again. The warning uh, went away, and everything is configured properly. So that's actually a story where the IDE allow us to implement more features in the framework and still help you, still allowing you to, to guide you for, on those features. Mm -hmm. So previously, on the cacheable annotation, the cache names attribute was mandatory. So if you didn't specify it, you'll get some kind of compilation error. So you, you would knew that you had to provide something. And the community reacted to that, saying, hey, um, I want to be able to share that. I want to be able to put that at class level. I want to be able to compute that programmatically. So uh, we implemented those features. And as a side effect, we had to put cache names as not mandatory anymore, which means that if, you, if you're new to that feature, if you're using that feature for the first time, you don't know the history, uh, well, you add cacheable on the method. Everything is fine. And then you start using it, and it blows up. But because we, we can have those kinds of uh, help in the IDE, the IDE can guide you and tell you, hey, you, you know, you need to provide a name. And uh, if you're new to that, well, you, you know that obviously something is wrong. Mm -hmm. OK, which brings us to our next um, area. Um, this condition attribute has some expression, and that's Spring EL. I hope everyone is aware what Spring EL is. Um, Spring expression language. Expression language, right. Uh, so what we see here is a condition attribute I can fill with uh, Spring EL expression, which will restrict the caching according to the given condition. And you can see it as soon as I move over one of those attributes, the highlighting changes in the method body using those method parameters on the uh, method I have here. And that's because the IDEA understands that this condition expression can refer to parameters by name here. So I can actually even control click here. And I have auto completion here as well for all the attributes which are available in this specific context of that annotation, because we built that knowledge into the editor. Uh, we support this kind of Spring EL support in various uh, other annotations, and we're going to um, add some more like this. It's really very nice uh, to just avoid any kind of typing errors or uh, using some stuff which is uh, not the proper way to do. Or having a list of what you can use, actually, yeah. uh, because we had that issue of users coming back to us saying, uh, what, what can I do in that field? Um, what properties can I use? What root contexts are available? Can I use cache names? Can I have an access to the method handle? Yeah. And the answer to all those questions are yes, but it's written in a Java doc, but you know, you need to, write, you need to read the Java doc first. Yeah. And yeah. if you can have auto-completion, it's much better, obviously, because you, you get the list immediately. Mm. So that's just a very quick example here. We have a Spring Security annotation. And that one even has some uh, methods which are available, like has role and some other stuff. You have auto-completion here. I can even navigate to the security role identifier I'm using in this uh, um, condition. And yeah, it really understands everything you're trying to do here. Uh, one other new thing in uh, the last version is that we have a dedicated uh, setup for Spring EL color scheme. 
Uh, it's a bit small here, uh, but trust me, you can set all the colors for the different attributes here to your liking. Uh, previously, it was hard-coded, so now you can really tune it. Uh, uh, when you use a lot of Spring AL, that's really useful. And you can also change the background color, which is quite easy yes. to mm. quickly identify the places where you're actually using Spring Expression Language. Yeah. Okay, so much about Spring AL. Who is using XML for their configuration? Don't be shy. 10% again. So I'm guessing that the 70%, since we had 80% of people using Spring Framework, the 70% are using Java config then? <laughs> it's a fair assumption. Yeah, okay, very shy, I can see that. <laughs> okay, so um, we'll give you a few tips and tricks about XML. Um, and well, the key for all the tips that we are going to show you is auto-completion. So do not hesitate to invoke auto-completion. Yes. You'll be surprised how many things you can get. So again, the first thing I need to do is to tell the IDE that this Spring XML file is actually being used in a context. We have this uh, highlighting here on the uh, editor level. Just creating a new uh, XML context with just that XML file and the warning is gone. Again, I get the model diagram so I can verify uh, its support here. And immediately we see another warning in the default auto wire uh, attribute here. So what default auto wire does is Inge what exactly? It's injecting by type. So simple bin probably uh, require a bin of type auto wire bin. It does. Here we so. go. Yeah. And uh, that, that instruction tells that instead of specifying the properties explicitly, like you used to if you do XML config, just use the, the, the same system as, the, as what you would do with Java config. Uh, find a matching bin by type in the container and inject that instead. Obviously, throw an exception if there are more than one. Mm. So the, the dangerous thing uh, with using default auto wiring by type is that you can end up having a different one that you expected. So there's a quick fix to make all these dependencies explicit in the XML. Uh, you can just invoke that quick fix and the uh, implicit auto wiring, which is happening behind the scenes, is now converted to a property here, which refers to the actually used auto wired bean here. So everything is written as it is. And, and if you go to simple bean, you'll see that the um, yeah. getter icon has changed. Yeah. So the auto wiring icon has changed to an uh, injected spring bean property, which is exactly what we did by making those dependencies uh, explicit. Um, if you have a lot of property attributes here, um, it becomes a bit hard to read. So there's another intention to convert this to the P name space, um, which is just basically um, a different way of uh, writing this. So you have the P name space here, and you can refer to all the properties of that bean and just use that shorter uh, notation. Oh, templates generated by patterns. Yes. So we have many, many things to show. We always have to make some kind of selection, but uh, one thing I really want to show you is the generate by pattern feature. So generate is usually, everyone knows generate code for getter, setters, two string, whatever, um, but there are also special patterns for Spring. Uh, some of them work in uh, Java code for creating uh, auto-wired fields, for example, uh, but there are some very nice ones uh, just for XML. So generate by pattern, and what we get here is a list or tree of various patterns sorted by topic. I'm um, just going to use a property placeholder configuration, which allows me to swap in configuration values via properties file. Click on generate, and it just generated that bean for me here, the necessary property, and I'm good to go. I just need to specify the location, specify the location of my properties file. And just you get auto completion yeah. again. So, and again, it knows that this is a Spring IO dot resource, so it can resolve to that specific property file. And if I were to use any of those properties where it's supported, just entering some fake. Abstract? Yeah, I'm just using a fake. Oh. <laughs> so I can navigate there and I can even navigate to the usages. Of course, this doesn't make sense, but if you were to use those uh, properties somewhere else. So there's much, much more for Spring XML, of course, but 
we also have some other very big interesting topics and I want to continue with Spring MVC. Let's go with Spring MVC. So you need to open a different project, I guess, for that? No. Okay. That's already there. So uh, to make it a bit more easy to understand, I'm just going to delete my manual context I set up for the other demonstrations. And what we see here is there is two auto-detected contexts, and those are detected by the e by the e automatically because they follow a specific pattern for setting up Spring MVC applications. Uh, we have an initialized server servlet context and a root context, and you can even see the parent hierarchy here, which is the uh, default for such setups. Yep. So let's very quickly go to the. So one thing, you, one thing you would like to see when you're working with Spring MVC application is, especially when you're working with a rendering engine, is to see the link between the, the name of the view that you provide in your action and the view itself. And the other thing that you do when you're working with a template engine is you fill in a model. Uh, so you put a bunch of attributes in, in the model and you actually use that in the template engine itself. So if you use time leaf, mustache, JSPs, or whatnot, you would, you would refer to the, to the um, keys that you, you set in the Java code in the action. And having a link between those two is very important, and mm. that's what we're going to show you. Yeah. So very quickly, this is the uh, MVC-specific part of the setup. Um, I'm configuring a few uh, view resolvers, uh, namely one for JSP, one for FreeMarker, also configuring a FreeMarker where to find the templates, actually and uh, going to my demonstration controller, you can see a variation of the Spring Bean icon here with a small world uh, icon. And that one I can use to navigate to the views I'm using in that request mapping. So I'm using my view here, and you can see, again, auto-completion and navigation. And um, I can jump to the actual JSP page, which I'm calling from that controller. So. That also allows us to calculate the actual attributes I'm putting into the model in that controller method. So you can have uh, auto-completion here. Um, another nice shortcut is a quick view definition, uh, control shift i which allows you to inspect the actual target of navigation with, without actually going there. So you can basically have a pop-up of the uh, other editor and just verify that this is actually what you expect it to be and control B back to the actual code which puts that model, uh, that object into our model. Um, a shortcut which is a bit related to this is uh, navigate related symbol. So that's a specific shortcut you can use for most of those cutter icons. Uh, whenever the cursor is at that position, it will show you a list of candidates which are interest interesting in that position. So in, in the case of the request mapping and the controller, uh, we can use that shortcut to navigate back and forth between the views and the controller or controllers using that view with one shortcut, so you don't have to remember anything else. The other thing also you can do with uh, that infrastructure is to list the request mapping that you have on your application. So you probably know, it's, is it double? Double, how do you invoke that again? It's the, 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 search, the search method, so the pop-up where you type slash and you have ah, the list okay, of actions. Yeah, that, that's a different thing. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, you yeah. have that one. So, so we, we, we have that list of uh, uh, controller methods sure. here um, in the Spring View, uh, Spring Beans tool window on, in the View uh, MVC tab. So basically, you have the same uh, functionality as I demonstrated for the Beans. And Another nice thing which uh, Stefan was just talking about is go to symbol, which also understands request mappings. And to make that work, I just have to type the forward slash, and it will show me all the request mappings in my project. So whenever you see some URL and you are not sure what this is actually doing, you can just use that shortcut uh, and go there and immediately know what controller, what request mapping is that. There is also some uh, code assistance in the mapping itself. So for instance, the ID uh, path variable that's being injected 
if if Jan just you try to rename it maybe, yep. then you'll you'll see that you'll get refactoring working out of the box and the the actual fields will be renamed as well. So I guess that's all about Spring MVC in a very short time. Of course, there's much, much more to show. Yep. But there's one other very big topic, Spring Boot. Who's using Spring Boot already? 50%, okay. I would say. So I'm creating a new project for Spring Boot. Um, probably most of you have heard or uh, maybe even used the uh, start.spring.io website, which allows you to generate template projects for Spring Boot. Uh, we integrated this, this in the IDE, so you can choose the Spring Initializer uh, project category to invoke this wizard, and it will actually use that website or web service uh, to have the same functionality, but within the IDE. So I'm just leaving this all as uh, defaults, and uh, you could oh. you could search for dependencies yeah. there. Yeah, what are all these dependencies then? So these these are the starters and the dependencies that Spring Boot, the core of Spring Boot, officially supports. So uh, whenever you add one of those dependencies, Spring Boot will recognize them by the mere presence in the class path. So by the fact that let's say you add the web starter in your project, it's probably because you want to build a web application. So we are going to start a servlet container, uh, configure Spring MVC, scan for controllers. We are going to do that uh, automatically. So in, in the case of this app, um, uh, we, well, yeah, and you can, you can search, and IntelliJ ID will highlight them. And there are also some, some dependencies that you can't select, and the ID will tell you why. So for instance, if we take Neo4j, uh, Neo4j has been introduced in 1.4, which is not released yet. Currently, as you can see on the upper left corner, uh, the Spring Boot versions that we have selected is 1.3.5. So it will tell you, hey, if you want to use that stuff, you need at least 1.4 M1. Mm. So we are just going with uh, the web dependency now, finishing the setup. I'm changing the project so we get a new one. And it will download that uh, so template it, for yeah, us so now. Pretty much not. If you if you go on the site directly, you have exactly the same kind of options. Then you generate project, you get a zip file. Then you need to ex extract the zip file somewhere and associate that in the ID. Uh, of course, the, by the time I'm explaining you all that, the project is already available and you can start mm. coding. So to come back to our very first example, we see a lot of gutter icons, uh, which indicates us that the IDE already knows what this is about. Because Spring Boot is actually the other type of uh, Spring applications which are completely auto-detected. So using the Spring Initializer, it will create a Spring Facet for us, and it will auto-detect the uh, Spring, uh, Spring Boot application for us. So you don't have to set up anything there. Just use the wizard, and you're ready to go. To go back. Again, to the other thing I showed uh, at the beginning, uh, Spring Model Dependencies, um, I'm going to show this. And it doesn't, doesn't really look um, impressive Very fancy. here. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's just this demo application uh, context, uh, the, the main class, and the uh, reference to the Spring Boot application configuration annotation. But things change when I switch on the nodes which are provided uh, not in the project itself, but from the libraries. So when I switch this on, and I relay out this. This looks much more impressive, right? So, what is all of this? So these are the, these are the things that actually Spring Boot will use on startup to um, provide you default con default sensitive configuration for things that are on your class path. So these are the things that the editor currently supports. Uh, it does not support everything yet because there are quite complex rules to make that happen. Um, but basically, these are some of the things that Spring Boot will uh, try to enable for you if you happen to have a library on your class path, a property in your configuration or whatnot. Mm -hmm. What that means is the, the inspection that you get, we, we were discussing about profile uh, early on. Uh, you enable a profile to tell the ID, hey, uh, I'm actually working in that environment. If you're using Spring Boot, all kind of things will be uh, configured for you, like you'll, you'll get the GDBC template automatically if you have a data source, for instance. So if, if you inject that, that GDBC template in your code, um, well, the, the ID knows about it, and it will tell you, yes, there will be a GDBC template in your application, and you will be able to resolve to it. Mm. 
So we are already nearly running out of time, so two little things I want to show. Uh, one is when you want to add um, another Spring Starter to your Spring Boot application, uh, we know about some popular or uh, heavily used uh, starters. So upon typing that annotation name or using specific classes, uh, you will get a quick fix again to add this starter in, in, in instead of a generic uh, Maven uh, dependency. And I can just in, invoke that and uh, quickly go back to our Maven poem. And the uh, starter WebSocket has just been added to my Maven project automatically because that's exactly what I want to use in a Spring Boot application. Uh, use the start as always. The other thing we can uh, just quickly uh, mm -hmm. introduce is uh, the application properties or application.yaml support. Why, why would I need this in a Spring Boot? Bec um, well, in Spring Boot itself, because um, the auto configuration is not static, so you can customize it in many ways. You can, first of all, provide your own configuration for certain aspects of it. So, for instance, if you have uh, the Spring Security Starter on your class path, we are going to secure all endpoints and will create a dummy user for you. And if you want to have specific users, you can only define the authentication manager of Spring Security and we'll use that and still configure, um, still secure all the endpoints. So you can write code. Uh, another way to customize the way Spring Boot will auto-configure your uh, components is to define a key that the auto-configuration exposes to tune it. So for instance, back to the example, you, you may use uh, security.username or security.user, I think, to customize the user that's been generated by default. And well, you need to know those keys, right? Um, so usually what you do is you go on Google Stack Overflow or maybe you read the doc. I heard someone did that once. Um, but it would be much better to stay in the IDE and get an, an auto-completion of the things that you can use. So that's for Spring Boot itself, and you can see it's really quite complete. You can see the list, you can jump to the code, you can see the, the documentation, you can see the default value if there, is an, if there is one. But the key thing I want you to remember is if, you, if your own application uh, requires some customization, so you have your own keys, your own customization keys for your own business logic, it's actually very easy to integrate your own keys into that uh, content assistance. Mm. Because the mechanism that we've built, uh, we made it available as part of Spring Boot, and it's really an easy process, um, and it has interesting side effects. Yeah, so the last thing is another gutter icon, <laughs> Spring Boot. Uh, usage in Spring Boot configuration files. So we are just using this setter, this property, which is predefined by Spring, but it would work the same way if you use custom configuration properties in your project. Uh, you will see the actual usages in the configuration files of those customization points. Um, you can even do a find usages and it will jump to the usage in the configuration file. So that's a very nice way to inspect uh, whether your application uh, is using all the, the configuration properties you're defining for your own application, which is a very powerful mechanism to tune your application at runtime. So I guess that's all. We have one minute left for quick questions. Anyone? Yep. I actually didn't really understand the question. I, I think <laughs> I understand the fact that you have many projects in your IE and you want to start them. Ah, okay. So yeah. the question is, yeah. Yeah, so th the question is basically why does the Spring Faster configuration not happen automatically when I import a project, right? And the point is, yes, you can do this. There's an, uh, in, in the Spring configuration um, notification, there's a link to create a default context, and that will add all the configuration files in one file set. That's maybe the 99% case, maybe not. So you are still free to, to customize the file sets by setting up uh, specific contexts. That's new. That might not be in the versions that you're using. Yeah, that's, that's a new thing. So you, you, you click on create default context and you'll have that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.